We might be seeing the first signs of progress in peace talks to end the war in Ukraine. Today, Russia claimed that it will reduce its military presence around Kyiv and Chernihiv. Drastically was the word they used. Today was the first time in weeks that representatives from Ukraine and Russia met face to face. They met in Turkey's capital, Istanbul, for around three hours. Ukraine claims that it is ready to declare itself a neutral state. That would mean, among other things, no NATO membership. But that would come in exchange for security guarantees in case Russia attacks again. The Russian delegation said it would consider the offer and promise to reduce military activity. Right now, no one seems to be taking this at face value. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says that recent negotiations with Russia have been positive, but they do not, in his words, silence the explosion of Russian shells. Ситуація не стала легшою. Масштаб викликів не зменшився. Російська армія все ще має значний потенціал для продовження атак проти нашої держави. And the US seems to agree. Press Secretary John Kirby said the Pentagon is not ready to believe Russia either. We believe that this is a repositioning, not a real withdrawal and that we all should be prepared to watch for a major offensive against other areas of Ukraine. Let's begin tonight with NBC's Ali Aruzi reporting from Lviv, Ukraine, near the border with Poland. Uh, Ali, let me start with these remarks from Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby and the reaction to Russia's remarks at the peace talks. He also alluded to Russia reducing its military force in Kyiv, as we mentioned, as a sign of trouble with its effort to lay siege to the city. Here's more of what the press secretary said. Statement: They they failed to take uh, Kiev, which we believe was a, uh, a a key objective. Not only did they not manage to take Kiev, they've not managed to take any population centers, and the Ukrainians have been fighting back very hard. So it's hard to see how they are succeeding uh, in any one place, except except at the death and destruction they're causing. So, Ali, with all that said, how do we put these latest peace talks into context? Well, I think uh, it would that people in Ukraine and Western officials wouldn't even be cautiously optimistic. Frankly, they doubt a lot of what the Russians say. As Secretary Blinken put it, what the Russians do and what they say are very different things. And I think that's why people are very skeptical that these peace talks are going to have any tangible difference in the short term anyway. And that's we can see that on the ground, that what they're doing and what they're saying are two different things. Uh, we talk about Kyiv, that the uh, Russians are saying that they are going to dramatically draw down their military operations in Kyiv, in Cherniev. But there was still heavy shelling around the suburbs of Kyiv today. Uh, that's not a place that they have dramatically reduced their forces either. As uh, John Kirby put it, just a very small portion of the troops have left uh, the borders and surrounding areas of Kyiv. Uh, take a look at uh, Cherniov today. It's a place that's still getting battered. It's starting to look like a siege and starvation campaign that they had put around Mariupol. Uh, it's uh, becoming a humanitarian disaster as well. People are lacking food, water, gas, electricity. So it's hard to believe that they're pushing back uh, and, and, uh, and leaving the capital, which is so important to the Russians as well. Um, the, uh, a top Russian general has said just last week that the first phase of their so-called military operations was over and they were going to concentrate on the Donbass area. That hasn't happened. Uh, they are still attacking large swathes of the east of the country. So I think it would be premature to assume that uh, Vladimir Putin has given up his aspirations of taking Kyiv, the capital. Maybe he's refocusing, but I doubt the plan has changed for now. What's the latest, Ali, in terms of the international effort to help Ukraine out? The U.S. has confirmed that it is helping train Ukrainian troops to use equipment in Poland. And recently, France's president, Emmanuel Macron, said that he was going to try and help with an effort to help the people of Mariupol evacuate. What's the latest in terms of the rest of the world's response to try to help Ukraine through this? 
Uh, that's right. French President Macron said that along with the Greeks and the Turks, that they were talking to Vladimir Putin and trying to open up humanitarian corridors out of Mariupol to get much needed aid into that country. And the French said that Vladimir Putin was thinking about it. Uh, but he wasn't going to allow that to happen until the fighters in Mariupol had laid down all of their weapons and essentially capitulated to Russian demands. And being here for such a long time right now, I can tell you the Ukrainians aren't going to capitulate. Uh, they will fight uh, until they have lost control, until there is no other option for them. But just to kneel down and surrender is probably not an option for them. And there are still about 150,000 people trapped in Mariupol. The mayor of Mariupol says that the Russians are playing with them in that city. And as, as for the training, uh, the U.S. said it's not really training the Ukrainian forces in Poland. They're liaising with them. They're giving them basic instructions on the communications equipment uh, and that this has been going on for a very long time and there's nothing new about it. Thank you, Ali. Do stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Ali Aruzi in Lviv, Ukraine, starting us off tonight. Let's continue now with William Taylor, a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. He is a vice president at the U.S. Institute of Peace, focused on Russia and Europe. Ambassador Taylor, welcome. Thank you, Joshua. Good to be here. Can I get your read on what the Biden administration has been saying about Russia's remarks? President Biden kind of said that he was waiting to see what Russia does rather than what Russia says. Secretary of State Antony Blinken kind of made the same point today. Here's part of what the Secretary of State said. I would leave it to uh, our Ukrainian partners to characterize whether uh, there is any genuine progress and whether Russia is engaged, engaged meaningfully. Um, what I can say is this, um, there is what Russia says and there is what Russia does. We're focused on the latter. And what Russia is doing is the continued brutalization of Ukraine uh, and its people. Uh, and that uh, continues as we speak. Ambassador, what do you make of that tone? I can imagine someone seeing that and thinking if Russia says that they're willing to stand down and make peace, cheer them on, you know, encourage that. Encourage them to keep along that line. But the administration seems to be rather more skeptical, at least outwardly. Joshua, you have to be skeptical of the Russians. There's, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that they will say anything. Uh, they will do anything that furthers their objectives, uh, in, including deception. Um, we know this. So that we, we are very aware of, of their tactics. Let's also focus on the Ukrainian side. Uh, the Ukrainians have, are the ones who have stopped that military advance, that the Russians have been stopped by the Ukrainians. No one thought this was going to happen. The Ukrainian military has performed heroically. Um, and at, by the same token, down in Istanbul, um, the Ukrainians are serious about those negotiations. They've come to each of these negotiations, Joshua, um, prepared to have real discussions. The Russians haven't. The Russians are, have not indicated that they're serious, and they won't be, Joshua, until President Putin gives them the okay. That won't happen until President Putin realizes, accepts, that the Ukrainians are winning on the battlefield. He, President Putin, is not winning on the battlefield. And at that point, when he figures that out, then he will be able to go and there will be some serious negotiations to get somewhere. So then, Ambassador, with that in mind, what's the point of the peace talks right now? If nothing's really going to come of them until Vladimir Putin decides that he wants something to come of them, is this just to kind of test the phone lines, make sure everybody knows how to find one another? Like, is this just laying the framework for when there's something serious to be negotiated? The latter. The latter, Joshua. Exactly right. That is, there, there needs to be, when, when peace comes, when there is an agreement, it will be based on a lot of conversations. As I say, the Ukrainians have given a lot of thought to what that agreement will look, look like. And they have been running this ideas by the Russians. The Russians have had no authority to respond in any substantive way, but there have been exchanges and there have been ideas that the Ukrainians have put on the table uh, that are interesting, that are conceivably the grounds for, the basis for, as you say, the framework for an agreement when it comes. That is, is useful to have that conversation. 
um, it's not going to be productive. But they're not going to decide. The Russians are not going to be able to decide until their boss, until President Putin agrees that this is the way to go, that this is the way to try to salvage something from this blunder. That's where this was a blunder. And I think President Putin understands that that's a mistake. And he's looking for some way to salvage something. There's nothing much to be salvaged. So, so the conversations are in, in order to put together something that the Ukrainians will, will agree to and that President Putin may well do. Let's get to some questions from our audience. We keep getting questions about NATO's role in all of this and what NATO's options may or may not be. Of course, Ukraine is not a NATO member. Poland is. Turkey is. Homer had a question about what NATO could or could not do. Here's what Homer left in our inbox. You had the ex-ambassador of Ukraine on your show. He indicated that you, Ukrainian couldn't be part of NATO because there were a few countries that denied it. I'd like to know a little bit more as to why that is so. Homer, thank you for that question. I think he was referring to another former ambassador to Ukraine, not yourself, sir. But in terms of the path of getting Ukraine into NATO, there's a long process that has to happen. That process is very nascent at best. And it seems like today, if we take what Ukraine said at face value, that it's willing to maintain neutrality, that changes the whole calculus of NATO right there in terms of what connection it would have in any way, whether it's a member or not. Just you're exactly right. Um, and, and Homer's got a very good question. It might well have been this former ambassador that said that, because I, <laughs> we've talked about this a lot. And it is true um, that uh, President Zelensky was looking for a way to secure his country. He's looking for a way to be sure that he's not attacked, or if he's attacked, he has help um, in defending his country. He's looking for some kind of an alliance. He thought, Joshua, that that was going to be NATO. And, and indeed, back in 2008, Actually, I was the ambassador in Ukraine at the time. 2008, President Bush was trying to get the process started uh, in, in NATO that would end up with Ukraine actually being a member. And, and Homer asked the right question, why didn't that work? Well, there were a couple of countries um, in, in the middle of Europe, uh, a couple of allied countries in, in NATO who were not prepared to get that process started in 2008. And they're probably still not. So. President Zelensky, still wanting to secure his country, would like to be in NATO, but he's, he's heard the message. It's not going to happen now. It's not going to happen soon. He still needs security. He needs security more now, now more, than, more than in the past. So he's looking for other ways to do that. And he's looking at the possibility of some model like Austria, Joshua. So Austria is a member of the European Union, not a member of NATO. It's not aligned with NATO. It, right. however, is in a neutral status, but President Zelensky remembers that that neutral status didn't protect him in the past. So he wants more than just neutrality. He wants assurances. He wants more than assurances. He wants guarantees, Joshua. He wants a guarantee from the Germans and the French and the Brits and the Americans and maybe the Turks um, and maybe the Israelis. Uh, he, wants, he wants guarantees from these guarantor countries that, will, that, that they will be there. If, right. if, if Ukraine's attacked again, these guarantor nations, in, in President Zelensky's view, would be there to, 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 to fight, to help them, to help the, the Ukrainians, to fight alongside the Ukrainians if that becomes necessary. So that's what he's like. That's, that's neutrality, but it's with strong guarantees. One last question before I have to let you go from Udell in Colorado. Udell asked, in Crimea, is there still resistance by the Ukrainian citizens there? Is it still possible to reunite Crimea with the rest of Ukraine? Ambassador, I feel like this is kind of the central question of this whole thing, this idea that Russia might be able to make some kind of peace deal with Ukraine that would allow them to keep the territory they've taken in the Donbass in eastern Ukraine, kind of near the Russian border, and then keep the territory that they took from Ukraine in Crimea eight years ago and sort of just kind of call it good. Like, I, I know I got to let you go in a second, but I don't see how that works. It doesn't work, Joshua. You're exactly right. Uh, the Ukrainians will not give up their own territory. They've made this very clear. They're going to continue to fight. 
they're willing to talk about that. And I think there's a proposal, for example, to the Ukrainians to put forward that they'd be willing to talk about that Crimea Peninsula, which is Ukraine, let's be clear, um, in 15 years. And maybe in 15 years, they'd be able to come to some kind of a conclusion. But there are creative ideas for dealing with Crimea that don't entail them giving, the Ukrainians giving it up. Former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor, appreciate your answers to our audience's questions, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joshua. Good to be here. Hey, please keep those questions about the war in Ukraine coming, especially now that diplomacy seems to be kind of advancing somewhat, or at least the framework is being laid for deeper diplomacy. We're at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can reach us directly by voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Still to come, the CDC says it is time for some people to get another COVID vaccine booster. Who should get another shot now? And when will it be your turn? We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Have you had all your COVID vaccinations? If so, you could be in line for another booster. This morning, the FDA authorized a second booster shot for Americans 50 and older. This new guidance also applies to people with compromised immune systems. The FDA authorization covers the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. All the new booster shots can be administered four months after the first booster shot. Hours after the FDA's announcement, the CDC formally recommended the second booster shot. A statement from CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky called the decision especially important for senior citizens and for older adults with underlying medical conditions. She added that the government will continue evaluating whether more groups of Americans need booster shots. Let's discuss today's move with NBC News medical contributor Dr. Vin Gupta. Dr. Gupta, good to see you. Welcome. Joshua, great to see you. Good evening. Can you get a little bit into the data just in layman's terms in terms of why the CDC and the FDA felt that a fourth booster shot made sense? You know, Joshua, the, the data here is actually, uh, there isn't a lot of it uh, for all your viewers out there. It's coming from our friends in Israel. And what they found was that fourth shot was really critical in keeping folks with high risk medical conditions. So anybody 50 and over with a high risk medical condition like cancer, if you're on dialysis, or anybody who's 65 and older, regardless of your medical history, that that fourth dose is really vital and in between that four to six month period after that last booster shot and keeping folks out of the hospital. That people that were four shots in versus three shots in who qualified as high risk were more protected from the hospital. And that's really the key point here. And I expect moving forward, Joshua, we're gonna see that every six month pattern for booster shots for this high risk group for the foreseeable future. Is that unusual for U.S. regulators to trust data from another, from another country as opposed to data from within the U.S.? You know, I, I will say, I think this is us learning that uh, we've been behind the eight ball when it comes to adopting what our friends across, uh, across the Atlantic are doing, whether it's in the U.K. with mixing and matching or in Israel adopting a proactive strategy on boosters for the high-risk folks. And the fear here is we've been burned so many times in the past. We're approaching a million deaths. Let's err on the side of caution and take some of these key learnings for the high risk groups. So I think it's a smart move here because it's targeted to the high risk. So this has to do with the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines. What if you got J&J? &J? Do people with a Johnson & Johnson shot have to wait? Can they take these boosters? What, what applies to them? I'm glad you asked that because that's, that's usually the question I get. If, you, if you've already received one shot of J&J, &J, you've been cleared for many months now Sec two months after that initial shot to get a second shot of J&J &J or a Pfizer or Moderna shot. Now, if you've already two shots in, four months after that second shot, you can get a third shot of, uh, of Pfizer or Moderna, preferably. So it's basically shot one, shot two, two months later, shot three, four months later, and both of those, that second, third shot, in the case of the J&J &J first shot recipient, should, should ideally be one of the mRNA vaccines. Let's put up a map that shows where we stand in terms of the changes in COVID cases. This map should show the changes in cases over the last two weeks. In most of the northern half of the U.S., there's been an increase in either an uptick or a spike, depending on how you define it. 
decreases in much of the south and the middle part of the country, cases increasing in Florida, basically flat in parts of the southwest of the country, in the west coast. What's going on? What are we looking at in terms of where we stand with the pandemic in the U.S.? Well, Joshua, you know, I think this goes to the fact that uh, where we're testing, we're picking up new cases because now we're seeing this BA.2 stealth Omicron variant rise across the world now here in the United States. The more we're testing for it, even uh, with strong population level immunity, the more we're going to pick it up, even if it's not really causing a surge on hospitals. So states that are still testing at higher clips are picking up more of these cases. What we're not seeing to the reassurance for all your viewers out there is a surge on hospitals. Daily deaths, daily hospitalizations are coming down as we expect and hopefully will remain the case for the next six months. I'm glad you mentioned that. So we got to look at that map in a different context now that we're talking about detected cases. Those don't quite correlate exactly the same to deaths and hospitalizations, thankfully, because more of us are vaccinated. Before I have to let you go, you mentioned this BA2 variant. The CDC said on Saturday that that is now the dominant variant in the U.S. It accounts for just over half of all newly detected cases across the country. Do the vaccines we have work against BA2? They do. Thankfully, uh, when it comes to what vaccines against contagious respiratory viruses do well, Joshua, they do phenomenally well against the BA2 variant, which is keeping folks away from folks like me. They prevent severe pneumonia. They keep you out of the hospital. What, what they're not doing well is preventing mild illness, mild symptoms, or testing positive. No vaccine against the contagious respiratory virus can be expected to do that. So this is a even more contagious version of Omicron. Expect that you're not going to be protected against mild illness. That's okay because you are protected against the hospital uh, against the hospital and severe illness. That's the purpose here, and it's, these vaccines are still doing their job. Ten more seconds, doctor. I just want you to repeat, reiterate what you said. It sounds like you said the vaccines are not designed to keep you from getting sick. They're designed to keep you from getting killed or from getting hospitalized. But you could still get sick even if you were vaccinated. Did I hear that right? That's 100 percent correct. Vaccine, great vaccines against contagious respiratory viruses like Omicron or the stealth Omicron variant. They will not protect you from testing positive, developing a sore throat or a cough or a runny nose. They will prevent you from developing severe pneumonia, seeing somebody like me in the hospital. That's what they do well. They continue to do that well. Dr. Vin Gupta, we appreciate the info, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, those COVID boosters will help us out in the short term. Meanwhile, the U.S. Surgeon General is pushing for more long-term assistance, a pandemic relief plan worth $22 billion. In a New York Times op-ed today, Dr. Vivek Murthy wrote that if the money is not approved, we will be, quote, struggling to keep up with a constantly evolving virus that will continue to threaten our health, our economy, and our peace of mind, unquote. The federal government already says it may run out of money to buy enough booster shots. That could be a problem, considering it just approved more boosters. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard has more. Now more than two years into this pandemic, the question is about federal funding for COVID care. And during the Trump administration, the Biden administration, it was a given, an expectation that the federal government would not only fund uh, COVID treatment, but also pay for the administering of COVID tests and COVID vaccines. But now up on Capitol Hill, the very question about the future of federal funding is taking place. As questions about a potential new COVID surge in America linger, the federal government's money to cover the cost of COVID care for uninsured Americans has dried up. You need to be compensated for the care that you provide. And so this is a risk as we move forward. Um, hospitals do not have the margin uh, to really absorb this. The federal emergency relief funds to cover the cost of hospital treatment for uninsured COVID patients, as well as COVID testing, expiring last week. I would urge the president and Congress to find funds to continue the safety net that's provided to make sure that people have access to care when they need it so that they can get those boosters so that they can get testing. The federal government posting a notice to health care providers the last week its COVID-19 uninsured program stopped accepting claims for testing and treatment due to lack of sufficient funds and coverage for vaccine administration will end next week on April 5th. The federal government saying it will also stop accepting vaccination claims. 
In the last two years, the relief programs have paid health care providers $11.3 billion for testing, $5.8 billion for treatment claims, and $1.6 billion for administering vaccines to the uninsured. One of those hospital systems, Valleywise Health in Arizona. It received $3 million in federal money for care and another 700000 to cover testing expenses. Many of these folks come in very, very ill and have a long extended length of hospital stay, you know, and require a lot of resources. The hospital this week now charging uninsured patients for their treatment and tests. Do you feel like your hospital system has been put in a tough situation to essentially offer care versus charge because there's a lack of funding coming in from the federal government anymore. My greatest fear here is we see these funding sources dry up, that people do not have access to things that we know have helped us. Two weeks ago, the White House's budget office sent a letter to congressional leaders with a warning that failing to provide additional funding for the COVID response now will leave us unequipped to deal with a future surge. We're going to continue to use all the resources we have. And on Monday, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra, acknowledging the pending challenges. We're going to stretch where we can. But there's no question, if we don't get the resources that we need, uh, we're just going to fall behind. And I don't think at a time when we're turning the page on this fight on COVID that we want to fall behind. Now, just yesterday, Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said that he had spoken with Republican Senator Mitt Romney uh, over a potential deal that would allow for essentially the replenishing of these federal funds here to cover the uninsured individuals. Uh, but the question is, was it was just earlier this month when uh, Democrats were unable to get 10 Republican senators on board as part of a spending package and ultimately stripped out this extra COVID relief of funds uh, from the spending package in order to avoid a government shutdown. And that's why the question here in the days ahead is whether the likes of Chuck Schumer is able to get Mitt Romney and at least nine other Republicans on board in order to replenish those funds. The story of the January 6th riot at the Capitol seems to have a huge gap in it. That gap is about seven and a half hours long in the White House records of that day. According to the Washington Post and CBS News, phone records from the day of the insurrection are incomplete. The call logs are missing from 11.17 a.m. to 6.54 p.m. that day. That time frame includes the height of the attack and former President Trump's speech at the rally beforehand. So what was happening at the White House during the riots? The president reportedly spoke to Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and Alabama Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville during the attack. The House Select Committee on the Riot is investigating this gap. But do those records still exist? Were they just left out from the committee's document request? Were they erased? Or were people in the White House communicating outside of official channels? Let's work through these what-ifs with MSNBC political contributor Sam Stein. He's the White House editor for Politico. Sam, first of all, what are these logs exactly? Are they just digital files? Is it like a physical written logbook? What are we talking about? The records that the president and his staff keep of every call that comes in and every call that goes out. Standard practice for a president to document these types of call logs. Standard practice for White Houses to document who comes to the actual physical White House and visitor logs. Uh, but with the Trump administration, it hasn't always been, or it wasn't always, standard practice. Uh, they did not, for instance, publicize visitor logs despite the precedent set by Barack Obama. And then here you have here, seemingly clear attempt to erase the actual records of what type of calls were coming in and out to the president in that critical seven hour plus window. Uh, keep in mind, uh, when Richard Nixon was uh, being investigated for Watergate, there was uh, a, a roughly 20 minute gap in, in phone records uh, and a phone recording records. This is a magnitude of 30 plus times that. Uh, and so the committee has a lot to uh, get at. What was happening? Uh, did they just uh, brush aside a records compliance request where they are they trying to hide actual incriminating data in terms of those call logs and whose decision frankly was it to make sure that these call logs were not turned over and i want to be clear at this point we really don't have anything to go on reliably no. that would explain where these call records went we know that they're missing we, we don't have anything they're to go missing. on yet in terms of what happened right exactly we don't know 
motivation. We don't know what happened. I mean, we could suspect by putting a couple dots together. We do know he was talking to people at that time, as you noted, uh, people on the other end, the receiving end of these phone calls have said, yes, we talked to the president that day. Uh, the fact that they were not part of the ultimate records of files on the logs suggests that something happened. But to your point, we don't actually have hard firm data. Congressman Adam Schiff sits on the January 6th Select Committee's Democrat from Pasadena, representing Pasadena, California. He spoke to MSNBC's Ari Melber about all of this. Here's part of what the congressman said. Uh, we have multiple points of evidence to try to fill in what was Donald Trump doing uh, and of perhaps greater importance, what was he failing to do while the Capitol was being attacked? Uh, and so we are able to put those pieces together even when we get incomplete records. So that's what Congressman Schiff had to say. Former President Trump did release a few statements this evening. One of them basically said that the committee is trying to destroy the lives of other people. He also released a statement repeating his lie that the election was illegitimate. What happens now, Sam, in terms of the efforts to suss out where those records went and the fuller picture of what happened on January 6th? Well, there's two real major questions here, for me at least. One is, when does the committee start wrapping up its business? We all know that there's sort of an end date here, which is the elections, right? I guess I suppose it can go a couple of months later, but at some point, this Congress ends and the next Congress begins, and in all likelihood, Republicans will take over, disband the committee. So there is an end date here, and you have to wonder when will they start coming out with actual, an actual report of what transpired. The second thing is, what does the Department of Justice do with the materials that this committee produces, if anything? Uh, we know that they've, the committee already sent uh, contempt uh, requests uh, for witnesses who have failed to appear. Will they do anything if they discover malfeasance, for instance, over the handing over of, uh, or the failure to hand over documents related to Collins? Will they make referrals to the DOJ for obstruction of the congressional inquiry? And if so, then the ball really goes into Merrick Garland's hands and it comes to him to decide, well, what kind of prosecution, if any, uh, can be pursued down these paths in addition to the paths or prosecutorial decisions you have to make around witnesses who are refusing to testify. And before I got to let you go, today the White House said that they would not extend executive privilege to Jared Kushner and Ivanka right. Trump. Jared Kushner is preparing to testify to the committee. Ivanka Trump, her testimony is still being worked out. What would the impact of not extending executive privilege to them be? In practice, not that great. And here's why. Uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump, the likelihood that they testify uh, against their father and father-in-law seems minimal to me. Uh, they could have gotten around it by exciting executive privilege, saying, in essence, you know, we, we need to be ultimately transparent in the advice we give the president. And if you're going to force us to testify, it will serve as a chilling effect on future senior aides. This White House says, no, you can't do that. You're not currently working with the president. Only the current sitting president can invoke executive privilege. Now what they could do, in essence, is they could plead the fit. And by that, they could just say, look, we're not going to give you incriminating evidence uh, or we're not going to self-incriminate here. And therefore, we're not going to answer your questions. We think this uh, whole thing is a charade and illegitimate. In essence, the committee stuck at the same point, which is you have uncooperative witnesses who aren't going to divulge any information that may be incriminating on their father and father. Now, look, I could be wrong. Maybe Jared Kushner and Ivanka just have a lot to get off their chest, right? It's possible. Right. But I just don't foresee that happening. And I imagine there's other avenues to get out of testifying fully. MSNBC political contributor Sam Stein of Politico. Sam, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Finally tonight, California could be in for a modern-day gold rush. Is that a good thing? Head to the Sierra foothills and you'll find the historic Idaho, Maryland gold mine. It has not been dug in more than 60 years. You see it there right near Grass Valley. And now it's on the verge of reopening. Some hope to cash in on the soaring price of gold. Others view the mine as a threat. NBC's Jake Ward has the story. Grass Valley in the Sierra foothills of Northern California is a vacation destination, the gateway to Tahoe and the Yuba River, but its history as a gold town is now back. An historic mine is now on the verge of reopening, pending county approval, over the objection of many local residents and businesses. What's your goal? Recreation. How about tourism? Because our economy relies on tourism. 
Yes. Yes. Oh, what's yours? Clean air. Clean air. Who's going to want to come to an industrial mining town covered in dust and traffic and smoke and noise? Tony Loria's house of 32 years sits a little over a mile from the mine entrance on some of the 2,800 acres of mineable land. He says mining activity could drain or contaminate his well water. Everybody that drives in says, wow, what an oasis you have here. You know? And it is an oasis. I mean, the water is the central feature here. Yeah, we have a fantastic well. We have 60 gallons a minute flow from that well. If our home lost its well, then our home value would be zip. Because it's not just providing this beautiful water we see here. It's your yeah. drinking water. It's your <laughs> irrigation water. It's everything. Yeah, yeah, it's everything for us. The mine closed in 1956 after a string of U.S. government decisions set the price of gold at $35 an ounce, making digging it out of the ground unprofitable. Now, Rise Gold, led by CEO Ben Mossman, has bought the mine and sees enormous potential. So this is the uh, main vertical shaft. So if you opened up this plate, what would we be looking at? That goes down 3,400 feet, oh. and um, we would reuse the shaft to access the mine. On the one hand, this stuff is the original cryptocurrency. It's not really worth anything except that we are all willing to pay a certain amount for it. But how much will we pay for it? Think about it this way. The value of gold right now is pushing about $2,000 an ounce. And a mine just like this one, right here in this region, produced about 6 million ounces of gold. Is my math right? Are we talking $12 billion? Yeah, so there's... You know, we haven't done enough drilling to know how much gold could be down there, but you can speculate that there could be at least as much gold in this deposit as the adjacent. So significant uh, amount of gold and a significant amount of money. You'll have to drain a huge amount of water out of the mine. Will that affect the water supply of people who live in this area and depend on well water? No. I mean, the short answer is no. The county has found that up to seven wells may be affected. And so all of those properties would have a water supply built. Built for them. For them, so huh. no charge. The company says it will create more than 300 jobs that pay twice the local average, and that the mine is solid rock with little risk of giving off dangerous waste. But some locals say it is not worth going back to gold. We have a very successful economy with almost zero mining. It really is based on uh, tourism, professional services for seniors and education. And for some, like local tribes, the industry represents a painful past. You can see the destruction from the original gold rush from space. It's like scarred the earth. It removed our people. It's a 97 to 98% loss of Nisenan people. They were enslaved, if not killed. So to talk about reopening it and everything's going to be fine is just completely absurd from our perspective. Most of Earth's gold is already mined, meaning this town is probably one of the last in the U.S. to ever weigh reviving the industry that first put it on the map. That's NBC's Jake Ward reporting. Tomorrow night, remember the ice bucket challenge to fight ALS? Well, that challenge funded a new drug that the FDA is about to review, and one of the researchers joins us tomorrow. Send us your questions about ALS and your stories about today's treatments. Reach out at NBC Now tonight on social media by voicemail or email. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.